Right, when you turn, why don't you turn with me, please, in your Bible to Mark chapter 15. And uh, we are going to consider uh, on this Easter Friday, this Good Friday, uh, some of the passage describing the events of that particular day. And uh, let's begin reading from verse 1, uh, Mark chapter 15. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Then if we go down to verse 16, and the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. They called together the whole battalion. They clothed him in in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. They were striking his head with a reed, spitting on him, kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Just so far, the reading of God's word. Lord, we come this morning to familiar territory. We have read these passages many times. We have reflected over the years and many times around uh, the table as we've Uh, had participation or as we participated in the bread and the cup but i do pray as we turn to these words this passage this morning that you would indeed give us insight and lord has earlier prayed eyes to see and ears to hear the significance the greatness the majesty lord that which you have accomplished for sinful men and women like us. And so we pray, Lord, we pray for your spirit, your Holy Spirit to be the one ministering to us, each one yet today, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I did some digging this week. I was trying to find out, trying to discover the worst kind of criminal that we have had in recent years here in South Africa. I discovered a man by the name of Moses Setoli. He was known as the ABC killer. A, because he killed people in Attridgeville, he killed people in Benoni, and he killed people in uh, Cleveland, in Johannesburg. Apparently, Moses was a pleasant person, most people thought, so much so that he even opened up a charity, uh, seemingly to help people in need. But what he did was he used the charity to lure women for an interview for a job. And then he would take them out into a field, out into a desolate place, and there he would rape them and he would kill them using their underwear to strangle them. This this kind of this happened by the way in 1994 and 1995. He killed at least, from what uh, was discovered in the investigation and conviction, 37 women and one toddler in that period of 1994 and 95. 95. He was found guilty and uh, was sentenced to 2,410 years in prison. It is said that he would have to serve a minimum of 930 years before he was eligible for parole. I think Moses Sitoli was a bad guy. I think Moses Sitoli deserved what he got. I think we would agree with that. Most of us here have no issue with that. We unanimously agree that serial killers like Moses Sitoli deserved what was given to them. But as we come to this particular chapter in Mark's gospel, what is difficult to understand, what is difficult to see, is how do we rationalize this fervent enthusiasm, this action by people who want to kill, who do kill sinless Jesus 
in him suffering and dying on the cross. And so this morning, I want to divide my message into two sections, two sections. I want us first to consider, see how the events around the cross will expose the nature of man. On the one hand, that's what we're going to be looking at. And on the other hand, we're going to considering, be considering the heart of God. And so to begin with, my very first point, look at Jesus suffering under the hands of men. Don't forget the context. There had been three years of public ministry where Jesus was seen to be popular amongst many people. We read of passages where there are people pushing, as it were, to see and to hear what he has to say. They want to be uh, participants in the miracles that he per performs. He wants to he they want to hear the teaching that he brings. And so in days gone by, these crowds had been fascinated. They had been enthralled with Jesus. But now, more recently, and I use this word very intentionally this morning, the fickle sentiment has changed. Now there is a ground swirl of hatred toward him. Now can I put that in, in simple terminology? I love you today, but I hate you tomorrow. That's what we see. That's what we see in terms of the change in the sentiment of these uh, people, Jesus suffering under the hands of men. And the uh, various aspects that I want to raise here, the first is that Jesus is unjustly condemned. We didn't read the entire passage, but the condemnation, his condemnation, follows a very definite sequence of contrived injustices. There has been a very intentional and deliberate conspiracy to discredit Jesus. The very first verse of chapter 15, the elders, these are the religious people, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin, reached a decision. In other words, there was discussion, there was collaboration, there was conversation. They reached a decision. They bound Jesus, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate. They had reached this deliberated decision concluding that he ought to be condemned based on false evidence, conflicted evidence. Chapter 14 and verse 56, if you were to read that portion, there was fabricated evidence enough to convince them, enough to uh, cover, as it were, their consciences to hand them over, hand him over to Pilate. But not just the religious leaders. Pilate knows how to play the political game. He knows how to draw attention to himself and make himself look good. And so we read in verse 10 that Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him, he chooses not to end their frenzy, not to stop the injustice in its tracks. Instead, we read in verse 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd, you see, a man pleaser, Pilate had Jesus flogged. Just by the way, uh, we have legislation today that forbids corporal punishment, just even if it is with a, a ruler or a stick. The particular instrument that they used was a, weather, a, a leather whip, a leather strap, which had pieces of bone or pieces of metal embedded in it. So this is what Pilate does. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. So here we have Jesus. He's innocent, but he's declared guilty. He's handed then over to the Roman soldiers as a criminal. The likes of Moses Setole condemned to death 
in the eyes of society, seen to be unwanted, seen to be despicable, and judged to die. It's the kind of death we like to see when a serial killer or a rapist is found guilty and the verdict is clear, needs to be removed from the face of the earth. But Jesus is not only unjustly condemned, Jesus is publicly shamed. We noticed in the passage that I read that Jesus silently faces a barrage of insults, jokes, all the jokes are at his expense. He's made the laughing stock of the Roman soldiers. Have a look at verse 17. Uh, they're making fun of him. They put a purple robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns. They're mocking him. They set it on him and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and they spit on him. Uh, falling on their knees, they paid homage. Did you get the picture here? Mocking, uh, publicly shaming Jesus, sarcastically and scornfully letting him know what they think of his claim that he is indeed king of the Jews. Even going so far as spitting on him. I don't know if you've ever had anybody spit in your face. I've never had that happen to me. But I do remember on occasion once, uh, I was serving in a youth ministry, and I don't know who did this, but somebody blew their nose, must have been into a tissue or a handkerchief, and deliberately wiped this green blob of snot under the handle of my car. So when I opened my car door, I got the message that somebody didn't like me. Can you imagine, <laughs> after serving, uh, anyway, maybe I'm just that kind of person. But, but the horror, the horror of those standing around Jesus, intentionally snorting to gather a mouthful of mucus, delivering a sickening projectile in his face. It's horrible even for us to think of that today. In their estimation, he was utterly loathsome, counted amongst those who were seen to be scum of the earth. The effort to humiliate him in the public eye continues as they strip him of his clothes. Mark chapter 15, verse 24, they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. Now get the contrast. At this particular point in time, his clothes are ripped off of him. Unlike the time earlier, remember in the gospel message, where his clothes were a symbol, an emblem of great power to heal, when the hem of his garment was touched. Unlike the time at the transfiguration where his garments became white, symbolic, emblematic of his glory as the Son of God, but now they are stripped from him and are divided amongst those who are there. They strip him of his clothes. They strip his clothes off his body in utter degradation and shame. So Jesus is condemned. He's humiliated. And then finally we see that Jesus is mercilessly executed. I think this is the lowest rung of humiliation. Jesus faces death on a cross. The Jews knew this. If you go back to a passage like Deuteronomy 21, 23, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day. This is anybody executed in this way. Because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. It's a method of punishment that was reserved for the worst kind of sinners. Worst kind of criminals. Outcasts of society on public display so all could see how this wicked person is suffering for their actions. So on the cross we have he who had done no sin, in whom there is no deviousness, is under God's curse, 
considered and reckoned to be among transgressors, as we read in Isaiah 53, numbered among transgressors. In Mark's gospel, we read in verse 27, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, one on his left. So my first point, looking at Jesus suffering at the hands of men. But I want to take it a step further now and see or look at Jesus suffering under the hand of God. There's irony. There's definitely irony that we ought to take note of in what is taking place. Who is Jesus and why is he suffering? Well, we're told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, who being in, very, in the very nature God, let's not forget that this morning, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, again, we need to put context and understanding to something of the irony, the, the, the drama, the, the, the sense, making sense of, of this kind of... Imagine, imagine someone, and I had a look again to see some of who are the richest men and women in South Africa, and uh, Patrice Matsepe is the richest man in South Africa, uh, one of the richest men in South Africa. He has a, a net wealth of $2.6 billion. Now, he's a wealthy man. This is a man of substance and status. Can you imagine him willingly forsaking that wealth and begging for bread? Doesn't make sense. Wouldn't do it. Or can you imagine someone like our president, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, delegated to the task of scrubbing the toilet floors at the union buildings. He's not going to do that. not going to do that. The rich do not beg for bread. Presidents have servants to clean the toilets. Why then, why then does Jesus, who's admitted that he's the Christ, who's admitted that he's the king of the Jews, silently and willingly submit to unjust condemnation? Why doesn't he react and defend himself against humiliation, blasphemous humiliation? Why does he willingly die under the curse of his Father in heaven? Three questions to answer briefly. Why was he unjustly condemned? Dear friends, God has said today when he will judge the world. Every single person from every single age, from every single nation, will stand before the judge. We're told in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. So that task has been assigned to Jesus, and therein lies the irony the one before whom the whole world will one day stand and be judged, allows himself to be unjustly condemned, allows himself to be given over into the hands of wicked men. Why? This is the good news. It was that you and I, we poor sinful men, women, and children, those believing on him, trusting him, may escape condemnation and hell. Justice will be served. God is holy. Sin must be punished. And the only way you can escape or I can escape that condemnation into eternal hell will be to be a recipient of the benefits of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Jesus did this. He was subjected to this so that we might be set free from every charge of sin. What a blessing. Presented faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. Question number two, why was he publicly shamed? Well, again, we need to see here, we go back before the world began, 
Jesus displayed glory, and he himself commanded honor. In a prayer to his father in John chapter 17, he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Glory he had, glory set aside in his earthly mission of redemption, glory restored. In other words, in eternity future, Father God will exalt Jesus to the highest place and give him the name that is above every other name. But now in this event that we remember today, he's in a situation of humiliation where sticky spit runs from his face. Why? It was that we, shameful and vile as we are, may one day have glory and honor and eternal life in the presence of God. This is not just an escape from judgment. It's access into the experience of the glory of God. On our own, we would cower. On our own, we would hide ourselves ashamed of what we have done and how we've lived in the presence of a holy God. But because of his shame, we will be received into God's kingdom with triumph to receive an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. It was done, to use another analogy, that we do not need to stand naked and exposed before God on the day of judgment. We, who have no righteousness of our own, will be clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. And folk, don't forget, don't forget, it was done that we who are dirty with sin will on that day of the wedding feast of the Lamb have a wedding garment wherein we may sit by the side of angels and not be ashamed. There's one further question. Why was he mercilessly executed? Jesus is accused of being unable to save himself. Again, the irony. Verse 29 of Mark 15, those who pass by who insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Everything seems to be upside down, the wrong way around. Why? You see, the one accused of the inability in the face of death helps those who believe, those who believe, you're a believer, you've received the forgiveness of Jesus, you've trusted him and his saving work. He will help those who believe go through the valley of the shadow of death fearing no evil, giving hope beyond the grave. So tomorrow, I'm going to the cemetery. It was Easter weekend two years ago that my wife died. And some people may say, why would you go to a cemetery? Well, I go to the cemetery because a good friend of me reminded me that it would be in that place that part of Pretoria, that my wife's body will be raised from the dead. And so to some extent, that ground is sacred ground. And you see, only because of the crucifixion of Jesus, and of course, the message we started the service with this morning, Sunday is coming. There's hope beyond the grave. A visit to the cemetery is not about hopelessness. It's about hope that God gives to us, that Jesus has accomplished. As a result of his work, every believer can enjoy the assurance. Death has solved the dilemma. His death has solved the dilemma of our death. The wonderful book by John Owen, it's called The Death of Deaths. His death, solving the problem for our death. 
He came to give life and life to the full. In, it is his death in our place that we who are miserable transgressors by nature and practice may be reckoned innocent. Well, my conclusion is really just three implications. I want us to leave here today to be reminded of and perhaps even to be seen, if you've not seen it before, the depth of the depravity in man. People are not basically good. That's nonsense. People suffer with a terrible depravity. Uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I hope you've seen something in this passage today of the fickleness of humanity. Love you today, hate you tomorrow. The life of Jesus taken by people who chanted again and again, crucify him. Weeks, months after they pursued him. And today we find the same. We find that people actively, through what they write, governments through what they legislate, or the ordinary person on the street in defiance and denial of Jesus, that he is the rightful king of this world and, and, and king of every man and woman, the depravity of man. We have a tendency to want things our way and not God's way. And so we need to recognize the need that we have, the provision that God has given, which leads me to my second implication. I hope you've seen today the extent of God's love for sinners. The sufferings of Jesus ought to be, they need to be seen, they need to remain what I would call a window through which we see the heart of God. But God, Romans 5 verse 8, shows His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In all of this, we see the indescribable love of God, confident, confident of His love as we face the challenges of life and the experiences of the difficulties, whatever they may be, the losses we experience, the disappointments we find, our depravity that exposes itself, the sin, the discouragement, the rebellion, the love of God does not fail. It does demand a response. And I want you to see third, my third implication, the enormous debt that we owe to God. Not only because He made us, but for the believer here this morning, that He saved you. For the unbeliever that He is willing, He's offering to save you. The enormous debt through His condemnation, acquitted, not guilty, justified. Through His shame, glorified, glorification through his death, regeneration, life. And so to urge on you this morning something of the love of Christ constraining as we go forward, Jesus died for my sin. I live for him, taking up my cross and following him. A deeper a fuller understanding of Jesus should make a difference in our lives, in our worship, in our service, in our sanctification. And so, Lord, we pray for that. Again, words can fall on deaf ears if they are men's words, my words. But, Lord, your words are powerful. And I pray that even this morning your words would be as a hammer and a fire Lord, breaking hard hearts, setting hearts alight, Lord, with passion and desire, zeal for you, trusting you for salvation, so rich and so free. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for our gathering together. Thank you that we can sing in response to that message of good news. Amen.